If we have not met, my name is Matthias. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to bring you the Word of God today, if that's all right. All right. Good, 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 good. So let me start like this to make sure we're all on the same page. A few years ago, uh, Danielle and I and our kids, we lived in South Miami down towards Homestead. Any NASCAR fans in the house? couple, couple, it's okay to be okay, it, like NASCAR, it's okay. So from my backyard, I could see the Miami Homestead Speedway, okay? So looking out my backyard, there's a speedway right there, almost walking distance. And we just built a house, brand new, moved in, and been in there for like a week. And as we're in this house, at night, Danielle was like, I hear something. Like in the wall. And I'm like, yeah, I heard that too. And then it would get more prevalent. And the next day it was like, and it was like, what's going on? Like our house is demon possessed. There is something going on. Like we anointed it. We moved in. We're pastors. And, and then it got worse. And then one morning I'm having my coffee and I see this mouse is bolting. In my mind, now I don't know what the difference is between a mouse and a rat. But to me, it sure enough looked like a rat, all right? So I don't really know what the differentiation is. But to me, it was like this big, okay? And, and I did what every manly man would do. I called Terminix. So, you know, I'm like, I, I, I need a pro assistance in my house. Anybody with me? So I, I called Terminix. The guy showed up, and, and he basically bought... He brought this picture book for guys. He kept flipping like a picture of a spider. No, not that one. Picture of a cockroach. No, that one. And then he come to like, what I, oh, that one. And he looked at me and said, you've seen that during the daytime? I go, yeah. And he goes, you've seen the alpha male. And if they dare to be shown during the day, check this out. You've seen one, there could be 60 more. That's what I said. I'm like, what? Where do I sign? Like, I mean, I love it. He was a good sales guy. It's like, you seen one? There could be 60 more. You have the plague of Egypt. Now, that was so amazing about this guy showing up. Do you, do you guys know? I'm not lying. Do you know what the guy's name was? His name was Jesus. So, so here's what's so funny. Jesus showed up to help me with my rat infestation. That's funny. I don't care who you are, Okay. Now, let me explain it like this, because you know, Terminix, uh, they'll come, they'll put traps, I mean, there is everywhere, okay? Having this conversation with my kids the other day, and John is like, I remember that. I'm like, yeah, because we had the plague of Egypt going on, right? And there's traps everywhere. Now, here's the thing about the trap. A trap is only a trap when you don't know it's a trap. Think about this for a moment. If you don't know it's a trap, you can get trapped. But if you know it's a trap, then it can become just a challenge, and you have to avoid it. That's what I'm going to talk about today, okay? So we've been in this series called Last Day Survival Guide. Who have all, you love this series so far? It's been good? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's been really good. And we've been looking at a couple of scriptures. In 2 Timothy, it says this. We have read it several times. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful and proud and abusive and disobedient to their parents, and that's not good. And then it says, ungrateful, unholy, without love. And if you're in the room, would you help me say this next word out loud? Unforgiving, and slanderous, without self-control, brutals and lovers of the good. People will be unforgiving. And then Jesus has this talk, and then in Matthew chapter 24, he gives an indication to his disciples of one of the signs of the end times. And we have read this one too, and this is in Matthew 24. It says, and help me out with the word in yellow, if you could when I get there, then many will take offense and betray one another and hate one another another. So check this out. Jesus gives us this picture and he's saying in the last days one of the signs that we are getting closer is that people will be trapped in offense. They will hold on to stuff. Okay? 
Now, let me tell you something that I'm offended by. And by me saying this, I will most likely offend a whole bunch of people in the room. I think we should allow the holidays to be its own holiday. And after that holiday, for instance, Thanksgiving, then you can decorate for Christmas. Amen. Let the holidays be its own holiday. And then when we celebrated that holiday, we can move on. Who did I offend in the room right now? Who's put your Christmas? Yes, the Pollys. Who else? The Murrays. Oops. Uh, who else? Okay, sorry. But you see what I'm saying? Like, I'm the guy that I let Thanksgiving be Thanksgiving, and then we decorate for Christmas. In my neighborhood, people have put crazy amounts of money and decorated all their houses, like, professionally. And I feel like they're, like, they're ahead of the game. Now, chances are I offended somebody in the room or even somebody who watched online who goes, I can't believe a pastor is talking about Christmas trees. That's a pagan holiday. And as believers, we should not celebrate. There's always one person. Do you see what I'm saying, though? I can't say one statement without offending at least someone. But could we agree on one thing? Could we agree, and check this out, that when you start to see Christmas trees and decorations, it's a sign that Christmas is coming. You go into the store and you see everything ready and you're like, oh, I got to buy my gifts, right? Or like you do what my daughter did. She sent me a list of everything on Amazon that she wants me to buy for her. That's a sign that Christmas, did Maddie do that? Okay, Maddie, I see you've been called out. It's all right, my daughter did that too. But that's a sign, right? A couple of weeks ago, my wife had put something on Facebook. It doesn't really matter what it is. To me, it was really neutral. It was neither this side or that side. And she ended up getting hate for putting something right in the middle on Facebook. And I go, we can't please anyone anymore. you got to be so careful about what you post and how you post it and all of that lovely things. It's like we live in this age of perpetual offense. Oh, you voted that way. Why didn't you vote that way? You didn't vote at all. Why not? And all of a sudden, what this does, it takes the focus on me, and I start to look at others. And when I don't look at myself, it gives me this false sense of security that, that you know, my life is pretty all right, but, but that person or that one, they have issues. And when you start to look at the little speck that's in somebody else's eye, and you don't look at what you are dealing with yourself, to God, honestly, you look pretty foolish. Now, I want to show you basically what you look like. When you have an issue with someone... And, and you take, I look at Jason down there, I'm like, bro, you went to that kind of concert? Thought you're a Christian, bro. And he's like, my pastor, what's going on? Look at your own life. You got a plank through your eye. And you're worrying about the speck in my eye. And you start to walk around like this. And I start to approach these guys. And it's easy to just whack somebody in the head. Look at Beth. She's like, I'm going to get decapitated. Do you see what I'm saying, though? You walk around with like a two-by-four going through your head, and the Bible says you should probably deal with that first. Are you with me? See, the plank through my head is made up out of a lot of small specks, and these small specks form a plank. And when we don't deal with the small stuff, it can build up in our lives. It's easy when you, when you touch that to get a splinter. And all of a sudden, that can lead to an infection. And now you actually need to go to somebody else and go, bro, can you help me remove the splinter in my life? Because I'm wounded and it's actually hurting me. I thought it was just a small thing, but it's actually not good for me. Are you with me so far? Say, I'm with you. If you're online, you should type that. Say, I'm with you. Now, this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, all right? Jesus said this, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Wow. Listen now, it gets deeper. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? It gets rougher. Check this out. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then... 
you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Wow! Now, just about a few minutes ago, I read what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said, in the last days, there's like a sign. And one of those signs is that people get offended. And when you start to see that becoming more and more prevalent, you can look and say, "Uh uh-huh. We are getting closer to the season of end times. Now, when Jesus used that word in Matthew 24, offended, this is the word that's in the original language, scandalon. Now, Jesus, I know this will come as a shock for a lot of people in the room. Jesus did not speak English. Sorry. He did not. So this is the original language, scandalon, okay? When you read your Bible, it's a translation from the original. Now you say, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Scandalon means trap. So when Jesus says, in the last days, many people will be offended and hold on to stuff. They're not dealing with the plank going through their own head. When they do that, it's like they are trapped. They are like that, that mouse or rat or whatever it was in my house that they keep catching and catching and catching and catching. And finally, we were plagued three in the name of Jesus. We could enjoy our home. People today, many people, are trapped in offense. They're holding on to stuff. They're saying, do you know what she said to me I was talking to my daughter yesterday, and and she was asking, what are you preaching about? And I told her, and Anna goes, I need that. And then she goes on to tell me about all this Instagram drama going on, and I'm like, oh, my word. I mean, how many of you would say, honestly, you need that? You feel a bit trapped sometimes. You hold on to stuff. And I'm going to show you, and you're going to leave here hopefully seeing this in a very different way. I believe the culture of victimhood has even entered into the church. Oh, I'm a victim because you don't know that was done to me. Oh, somebody, somebody stabbed me in the back. I'm a victim. Somebody hurt me. Growing up, I went through X, Y, and Z. I am a victim. And you sit and you live through a victim mentality. I'm here to tell you, church, this book here, the Bible, says you are not a victim. You are a warrior. You are an overcomer. You are a victor. Why? Because Jesus Christ has already won. You should stand on that. Live like that. Now, I know somebody in this room will say, Pastor, you don't know. You don't know what was done to me. You don't know how. And and I don't mean to discount anything that's been done to you. And in a room this size and by the viewing audience, there's some horrific things that's been done to people. I'm not discounting that. But what I'm saying is this. You are not what was done to you. You are not that should not define you. You should allow yourself to be defined by the word of God and who he says you are and by what he says you can do. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you have done. Through him, you can do all things. Come on, somebody. Give him a hand. Yes. Now, So often we are trapped by what's been done to us and we hold on to it and we become like that little mouse inside of that trap. Now I wanted to show you an illustration of what this looks like and I hope this visual will really, really give you a good idea. So I've asked my oldest child, my son John, to come on stage to help me out with this. Would you all give John a big hand? Come on somebody, let's see if he's ready. Oh, look at that. Single and ready to mingle. <laughs> See if he's stronger than making up on this for me. Boom. See if I use my son for this. Whoa. We don't need masks because we live in the same house. God is so good. Just something about water. Here's what happens. How many parents do we have in a house? How many parents do we have online? A whole bunch probably. Can you be honest with me? As a mom or as a dad, would you say you've made some big mistakes? You've done some things you're not proud of? Me too. 
I've, I've done quite a few, and I'm sure I'll probably make a few more. What if, what if I, as a dad, I disciplined my son, John, but I did it out of anger? And I, I didn't cool down, and I, I just, it was just what it was, right? I just snapped, and I was like, no more, not in my house. Here's what happens. Picture each plank as an offense, okay? So I now do that to my son, and I deal this to him, and he takes it and he plants it in his life. And we never really deal with that issue between us. I just think we're all good. It was yesterday, it was a week ago. He's fine. Looks like everything is good. But he hold on to that offense. How about this one? Have you ever felt, perhaps a lot of husbands in this room, you've probably done this, where work kind of became the number one priority in your life? And you justified why you did what you did. I need to make the money. I need to do X, Y, and C. But do you know that sometimes work can become the thing that pulls you away from your family? And as a pastor, and I know it's, it's weird for you to hear this, but as a pastor and with a pastor's kid, sometimes church can become that one thing that takes dad away and church becomes an issue. And if I don't deal with that right, and John start to look at church as the thing that pulls dad away and there everybody's celebrating him and loving him and doing everything, but I'm not there for the games and I'm not there for the stuff. It's like I'm handing him another offense and he plants it in his life and I never deal with it. And there's something else now. Now what if, as a dad, or as a mom, or as a business person, all of a sudden, I don't treat him with the respect and the dignity that he deserves to be treated with. He's 19, he's an adult. But I look at him as my firstborn. I remember the day we took him home from the hospital. And I still kind of treat him that way sometimes, and it's easy to do as a parent. But he's like, Dad, I'm not 14 anymore. I drive a car. I have a full-time job. I have a retirement account. I am a man, but I don't treat him as a man, so I give him another offense to hold on to. And as you start to see, all of a sudden, there becomes to be a barrier between me and my child. Have you ever held your kids to a different standard than other kids? It's kind of easy to, to give grace to somebody else's child, but then it's your own child, and you're like, mm, no way, not here, no how. And all of a sudden, when you do that, and I've done it many times with John, I've handed him something, and he takes that, and now between us there's a barrier. Between us there's something that is limiting us. Between us there's something that removes that closeness that always was. Church, here is what I'm trying to teach you today, okay? I'm trying to teach you that offense builds a fence. Offense builds offense. I'm talking in business relationships. I'm talking as husband and wife. I'm talking as mom or dad with your children or you with your best friends. If you don't deal with stuff, it, it starts to limit your access. And even though you're close in proximity, you are still miles apart. Can I be real? I have done that and more to my son through the years. And there's been times when I had to come to him and say, John, I need to apologize. I blew it. I was not the best dad. I should have seen it differently. Here is what happens. When we are trapped in offense, we need to learn to walk in forgiveness. And when we walk in forgiveness, basically what happens is that we start to remove those planks that's been put up. We start to build a barrier of healing. And we start to build a bridge of healing. Are you with me? So let me give you four quick things of how you actually remove these planks, okay? First one is this. Treat everyone with respect. Treat everyone with respect. In 1 Corinthians, it says this, that, that love does not dishonor. Love does not dishonor. We honor up, we honor down, and we honor all around. We love people. Now, you might have somebody in your life, and you say, Pastor, I can't love that person. They got 99 problems. Well, perhaps there is one good thing in their life, and if you focus on that. Now, somebody is like, no, Pastor, that person is maxed out 100 out of 100. Well, at least that person is made in the image of God. You can at least respect 
and honor that fact. Jesus said this, and I love it. Do unto others. Do unto others what you expect that they would do to you. That's called the golden rule. Isn't that the truth? Listen very carefully. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, it says this. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. And when you treat people with respect, what happens is that one by one, those planks will start to come down because now I am respectful. Secondary is this. we got to expect unfair treatment at times. you just got to expect unfair treatment in business, in life, in marriage, in school. Do you know one thing? Life is not fair. I'm sorry. But that's why I love this book, because this book tells us the truth. It's not just a sugar-coated version of come to a church, pray a prayer, and God is going to bless, 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 bless. And I do believe in a God that blesses, but he blesses you so that he will be with you even through the hardest of times and when things don't go your way because you are not alone anymore. In John 16.33, in this world, you will have trouble. That's why I love the raw honesty of Jesus. It's not always going to be a beautiful day. It's just not always going to be that, that perfect Hallmark movie. Because that's not real life. But you know what? Jesus will never leave you. And he will never forsake you. Now some of you will say, well, that's not that positive to say expect unfair treatment. You're like, that's not that positive. Oh, it is positive. I am 100% positive it's going to happen to you. 100%. It's going to happen this week. It's going to happen a month from now. And if Jesus doesn't come back, it's going to happen again. I am 100% positive. See, here's the deal. This world is suffering under a plague. And I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about the plague of sin. And if we understood and treated sin as, as we treat COVID-19 and understand that the consequence of sin is death and it's eternal death, we better wake up to reality that some people will mistreat us, say some things about us and even treat us in a manner that we don't wish our own worst enemy would be treated. But when we expect it, it is basically this. We let one more of those planks go down. And you see what happens when you remove, you see more of John back there. Because the barrier is less. All right. I love this one. We got to lighten up. Everybody say lighten up. If you're watching online, type that right now. Type lighten up. Don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. It's not good for you. Put the scripture here, Proverbs chapter 19. King Solomon, wisest guy that ever lived. This is what he said. A man's wisdom leads to patience. And then he says this. It's to his glory, not God's glory, to his glory, to overlook an insult. A man's wisdom leads to patience. And it's to his glory to overlook an insult. That's good. 1 Corinthians 13. If you've ever been to a wedding, this is like... What we read as pastors during weddings, love is patient, love is kind. But if you think about this, it says love does not keep a record of wrong. Love does not keep a record of wrong. No, we need to let that go. Perhaps he offended me. Perhaps he said something to me. Perhaps he slammed the door, said, Dad, I hate you. Of course, that's never happened to anybody, right? <laughs> right. I wish I was born in another family. Of course, no child has ever said that to their mom or dad. You are whatever word they chose. But love is not easily angered. Yeah, we got to do that. Last one, my favorite out of all. You got to set an expiration date on conflict. You got to set an expiration date on conflict. So I love working out in my yard, dominating my neighbors. Green is grass. I mean, I'm talking February, come by my house. It's going to be so green. <laughs> Jesus, forgive me. 
Picture working outside on a hard, warm day, and you get sweaty. Okay, ladies, forget about this illustration, and all men pay attention. You're sweaty, dripping in sweat. You're coming inside, and you're like, oh, it's so thirsty. You open up the fridge, and, and all you see is a big jug of milk. So, I mean, if you're thirsty, what do you do, guys? Just take the jug of milk and drink out of the jug. Ladies are like, no. Way. Yeah, he would do that, just not when you don't see it. Now picture if that milk had expired two weeks earlier. <laughs> oh, oh, no. oh, nasty expired milk. Do you know why they put an expiration date on? Because we need to pay attention to it. But why don't we do that in our arguments and in our disagreements and in our issues between people? Because the Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And if you let that happen, it goes on to say, you're giving the devil a foothold. So if I have an issue between me and my son, and I've had that, and I say, John, we need to deal about this. Dad messed up. And I say, do you know what? We're going to just let that go. And all of a sudden, that barrier that used to be there is now gone. Are you with me? Here's the big idea. To survive and to thrive... In the last days, we need to choose forgiveness. Everybody say choose. Listen here now. It's your choice. It's your choice. Because when somebody comes your way and they hand you an offense and you now hold on to it, you know as well as I do, you can't control what people do to you, say about you, how they treat you. A lot of times that's out of your control. But you also know it's up to you if you choose to hold on to it or not. So what you need to do is you need to let it go. You just need to let it go. Because if you hold on to stuff, it will weigh you down. You're in a business transaction. And somebody don't treat you the way they should. And all of a sudden they hand you something. And now you're being weighed down by an offense. Church, would you help me out? What you need to do is you need to let it go. And you just let it go. But pastor, I don't know. Is it really that easy? Yes. You need to let it go. Because when those offenses pile up, and all of a sudden, let's see if you can handle two of them. Not waste just a little bit more. But picture if it was three or four or five or six or 10 or 20 or 100 and he is just holding on to stuff. And you're like, you don't know what they did to me, pastor. I would say if you only could see how God sees you, you are being weighed down and you are not hurting the other person. You are actually hurting yourself. And online and in this room, you need to tell John what he needs to do. We need to let it go. That's what we need to do. Everybody give it up for John. Yeah. We need to let it go. We need to let it go. Because when you let it go and let God deal with it, and you work on you, you can be all that God wants you to be. We have this false sense, and this is the trap I've been trying to show you today. That, oh, you don't know how much that hurt me, Pastor. You don't know the financial setback. You don't know what that relative did or what they said. You don't know that. You can still remember and hear every word. It hurts. Like I told you, many times I had to sit down with my kids and say, Daddy blew it. With my wife, I blew it. I'm not perfect. I'm sorry. Let's not be weighed down with this. Let's walk in freedom. This is why we offer freedom groups here at this church. If you haven't done one in January, you should sign up. And go through a freedom group to learn what it's like to be able to stretch up your back and raise your shoulders. And be who God wants you to be. Here's what I want to do. If you feel, say, Pastor, I feel like you're speaking to me. I'm seeing a little bit of myself here. Would you wave to me? All over this room? Yeah. Wow, lots of, lots of hands. Yeah, that means I'm not alone. Good, you can take them down. Because if you're honest and real, we have all made mistakes. 
we'll probably still make more mistakes next week. But the beautiful thing about this book it says we don't have to be alone in that walk. And we can let things go. And He will redeem and renew. I'm not saying you're going to be the best friend with the person that wounded you. That might not happen. You might need to love them on a very big distance. That's okay. But my friend, I'm talking about you. I don't want you to be weighed down. So I'm going to go two quick things here. First thing is this. For everybody that raised their hands, there were so many. Whatever that issue is, I want you to picture what it is for you. Perhaps you need to have a conversation with someone. Perhaps you need to send somebody a text message or an email. That's fine. Or sit down one-on-one. -on -one. Take somebody out for lunch. Get away from the phones and say, I need to talk to you. This might not be something you even realized was there, but I'm looking at it. It's kind of like a barrier. It's like a fence. If you raise your hands, I want you just to hold up two hands like this. And I want to pray for you. And just signify to God that you're letting it go. The hands are open. They're not clenched. You're not holding on anymore. So Lord Jesus, every single person in this room, every person watching online right now, that is saying, Lord, I need to let it go. I don't want to be trapped in this cage anymore. I want to be free. I don't want to be weighed down. As they're doing that in this room, as they're doing it online right now, let them feel weights just coming off. Let them feel peace replacing whatever was there before and hope. And let them feel lighter instead of carrying that weight. I ask for your blessing on everyone right now that is doing this simple prayer, both online and in this room. And I thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Second thing. We're going to do this. We'll do this with everybody looking, nobody bowing their heads or closing their eyes. Some of you cheat that noise. Peek around. I can see it from up here. Online, same thing. Can't see you, but you can see me. If Jesus were to come back today, do you know that you're ready? Are you good with him? You might say, I don't know. Well, then you need to know. Once online, right, as well. If you say, I, I, I don't know that I would be good, but I want to know. Today, I need Jesus. Online, I want you to type in, that's me. That's me. I need Jesus. But if you are in this room, say, Pastor, if Jesus were to come back, I honestly don't know. I'm 50-50 on it. But you need to know that if he came back today, you would be good with him. Would you lift your hand? If you're in this room and say, I don't know, but I want to know. I want to be 100% real with him. Could be that everyone in here is perfectly fine. And that's beautiful. I'm going to go one more second. Looking left and right, up and down. Online, if you, that's you, type, that's me. Awesome. Seems like everybody's good, and that's beautiful. I'm sure we have lots of people online responding. Amen.